In 1988, Rhea McDermott, uh, an ethnographer and a linguist, wrote a very important and interesting paper called Inarticulateness, and it is below this video for you to see if you would like to. In it, he describes how he was commissioned by um, uh, schools in America to come and videotape classroom behaviours so that he could make a study of the behaviours of children who were considered disruptive and difficult. Uh, in the hopes of helping the, uh, the schools devise some sort of strategies for how they could deal with these children. He says that he watched the videotapes over and over again and discovered that indeed these children were not articulate, inarticulate at all. Their moves were highly articulate. For example, he says every scratch, every call not to be included was a call uh, for something. In the latter case was a call perhaps to be included. Uh, and he says this too. Inarticulateness can be understood as a well-orchestrated moment in which it is invited, encouraged, duly noted and remembered, no matter how much it is lamented. So what McDermott discovered was that this, the inarticulateness of some students is orchestrated. There is a biography of events to any, for any student who is, is not speaking or participating in the group. Um, there is uh, the idea has been put forward that students who don't speak are also contributing. That may be a problematic view because it may be that they wish to speak actually. This is what we discovered at the University of Hertfordshire in the Humanities Department when we ran a survey of 100 students, 58 responded, asking them to uh, answer some questions about their seminar experiences and one of those questions was how do I rank my contribution in seminars. The, uh, the 58 students seemed to fall into two camps with very little in the middle. Um, around 26 students had said that they thought their uh, uh, reporter, they felt that their contributions were inadequate, poor, weak, disappointing, not very good. The other uh, 58 students um, seemed to think, uh, sorry, around uh, uh, 28 students seemed to think that um, their contributions were good, pretty good, excellent, more than adequate, and so on. Um, most importantly, the next question for all students was, why do you rank your, uh, your contribution as you just have? And the students in the first camp, shall I say, uh, gave these responses. First, there are big mouths, they said, loud mouths, teachers' pets. That was interesting. And then, um, as one student very tellingly said, I write down what I want to say, and then the moment is passed. This seems to resonate with what uh, Yvonne Turner talks about when she says that some students have a tendency to pathologize silences in group work, in group discussion, so that other students cannot get in to the discussion. And in her, in her study, she has found that um, her study, Knowing Me, Knowing You, 2009, uh, she found that it was international students who were being disadvantaged in this way. And she wanted to ask, how is it that we could be so colluding in the system, an imperial system, that allows uh, the, the advantaging of uh, local students over international students. But again, if we go down deeper to the psychological processes, uh, the psychosocial processes that all our students may be experiencing, we start to get different answers to her question than perhaps the answers that she came to. So students who are not speaking may be inarticulate for a lot of reasons. That doesn't mean they have nothing to contribute. They need silences to get in. And the other camp of students in our survey were also interesting because they would say, I rank myself as pretty good because 
I can jump into any silence. I will fill a silence. I can talk for England, even if I haven't read the scripts, even if I hadn't read the texts. So here you have some sorts of resentments growing. And if you look as well at the students who are speaking, is this substance or not substance? Remember what Yalam said about substance. How do we feel about the confident speaker who actually hasn't read the texts? Um, if we look deeper, we see some resentment by the articulate students, the more fluent students, the more confident students, um, towards those who don't say much. Things like, I'm not sure why these people bother to come, for example, turned out. When we look at why students don't speak, and many of these in this particular group were white local native speakers, students were saying things like, I feel that I don't know the right answer. I could say something wrong. Or other students are more articulate and fluent than me. Or I may make a fool of myself. These are the discourses that are attributed to international students in the literature on international students, um, sometimes um, less than satisfactory experiences in group work and in higher education. This brings us back to the point that these are again underlying psychosocial processes, universal, that may be shared by all sorts of students, no matter what category uh, a particular literature has put them in. Um, that divide and rule amongst these groups is also something to watch very carefully and beware of because it means that each group being separated from each other, uh, a far cry from what Zapata Barrera asks us to do in terms of walking in and actually accepting, understanding we walk in and out of each other's cultures, um, is only more divisive and more problematic and more and creates more challenges for uh, those of us who are trying to set up intercultural and more compassionate environments for learning in. The quiet students can be helped. Uh, they have something to contribute. And one way is to say to students, eliciting, if you look at the assessment criteria, eliciting, that means inviting others, is something to be rewarded for. It's very important. Um, and that can be done through inclusive eye contact. The problem with some very quiet students, if they are very nervous, is that they will sometimes exercise avoidant eye contact. Avoidant eye contact. So they may be doodling, or they may be looking at their phones. They're actually listening very carefully. They're not wanting to be rude, but they don't want to attract attention. It is very difficult in that case for students to exercise inclusive eye contact with them, to invite them in, so more must be done. They can ask the student, by name, by name. Um, um, Julia, what do you think? Or um, uh, Soraya, what, is, what are your thoughts? Any student in the group can do that constantly. A warm tone, a warm voice. I have heard students invite others in quite aggressively. Well, what do you think then, Bert? What do you think? Um, in ways that will make that student um, visibly shrivel. A student who has been invite, invited a few times will start to come in more readily. This doesn't take as much time as you think, not at all. Even if the student is not with the same team, because we're hoping to change team memberships every week, this confidence can grow pretty quickly when there is a compassionate uh, and we are talking explicitly about compassion to students when there is a compassionate pedagogy at play. Some quiet students feel that if they do speak, there's another problem to face, and that is that they, they may run out of steam, they may freeze, and then there is an awkward silence. But if other students are ready to prompt, not take over, but to prompt gently or to ask a question to keep the quiet student going so they can pick themselves up again. That is very helpful. Or if they are willing to um, um, uh, simply take over and just say, that's a very good point. Uh, yes, what Saray is saying there reminds me of or suggests to me that just take it over. Uh, take over from it. Don't cut off and, and take it over. 
So these, we've been very explicit about this and suggesting to students that they're going to be absolute Jedi masters at running uh, really productive group work if they can get a hang, uh, the hang of this and they can learn it, they do learn it very, very quickly. Something else the quiet student can do is, if they freeze, is just pass that hot potato and say uh, to the others, uh, what do the others think? What do you, th what do you think? Or even choose a name, Robert, what do you think? To throw the ball to somebody explicitly. It is not difficult to uh, tr bring together students' uh, um, confidence, who, those who have been very, very quiet, if we are not doing this too late. Um, and this is why we suggest that, uh, I would strongly suggest that um, it is great to have been invited into the school system as well to talk about this and to work with uh, uh, students in school too where these skills have a tremendous head start in higher education if the skills have already been taught. Again, very easy to do starting in school and as early as possible. So just to point out again, there are, there are assignment criteria in a couple of versions uh, underneath this film and there is also um, a chapter, pre-print at this stage, of um, what compassion, what compassionate group work looks like in the UK. If you're interested in the, st the classroom stories, the critical incidents, the events that have helped put together our understanding of these microethnographic skills of compassion, then you might enjoy having a look at that chapter. Um, and in addition, I'd like to say that hopefully you will start to find if you're using this kind of group work that you have less and less to do, not more and more in seminars. That you will be able to take a hands-off approach and when you see that students, perhaps in the first week or two, have brought very little to discuss, you can gently over their shoulders suggest that uh, um, maybe something from Google is not quite what is needed for the group um, and uh, team them up as someone, um, I don't know, Bill, who's brought something from a journal that was very, very apt and helpful. Just say, Bill, could you please help um, um, John with his uh, uh, research skills a little bit and maybe even uh, ask Bill and Janice. Uh, so that there are two mentors to take over this student and just help, help, so that next time he brings something of better quality. So this mentoring together is another way to extend the compassion outside the classroom. Another tip is to get them on WhatsApp. Students are very, very good at helping each other in very transparent ways for the whole group um, through WhatsApp. Uh, so you have less to do. And finally, it's almost hands off. Uh, and you, I've seen tutors, I've observed tutors who've got this going and then been very interested to have the references of uh, articles and other um, texts that students have brought to talk about, to explain to others. And students noting, he's like one of us now, he's just like a student like us. And this again changes the, the egalitarian moment in the classroom. Students who have said as well, these uh, seminars have become so interesting. In other words, other students are so interesting. It would be great if they could go on longer, perhaps even for three hours, because there have been times when we would really like to have gone on, but they are being asked to leave the room. Um, another class wants to come in. So. Once these get going, there is very little for the tutor to do except to just keep looking at what's being brought in. And each student can have a portfolio of their articles that they build up. Remember when they leave the classroom, they will have been exposed to four articles. Um, uh, each article is introduced with uh, the name of the author, the publication, the date, just as it would be referenced in a piece of writing. Uh, and some students I've seen literally punching the air to have learnt so much so fast with the ability to compare what has been thought about in these articles in terms of um, variables that might be missing from a methodology, questions that they might want to ask the author if the author was sitting with them in the group, um, uh, all sorts of ways to uh, stimulate students' critical thinking with each other in preparation as well for the, what they can do in their writing.
So overall, I'm hoping that the videos that are here so far have been useful and helpful to you. I'd like to um, uh, suggest that perhaps you might want to join a GISC list um, uh, of like-minded uh, university uh, uh, tutors and teachers who are hoping or working already uh, on putting compassion onto their curricula. And if you are interested to join us as we work together on this endeavor, supporting and encouraging each other, uh, there are 24 universities involved so far from Europe, Canada, the USA, then the name of that is I hope this is helpful. Take care and all good wishes from all of us.